set me free. Jesus set me free. Praise the Lord. We want to welcome our guests, those of you that are with us for the first time. We're honored to have you join with us today. And if you would, let us know that you're here. You can do that by scanning that QR code that you see on the screen right now. Take you to a place where you can let us know, a connection where you can let us know that you're here. Provide as much information as you'd allow us. We protect that information, truly. We'll not abuse it in any way, but we do want to know that you're here and celebrate your joining with us and being honored. Uh, if you're not able to use a QR code on the back of the seat in front of you, there's a card. It is this card, and if you will take that card, and on the reverse side, there's not only a place for you to connect with us, but there's other information that you might want to glean from us, including for those of you that are here this morning and during the service at any point in time, that you surrender your life to the Lord, you can let us know that you made that decision of faith, perhaps rededicating your life to the Lord or maybe for the first time. And by doing that and letting us know, give us an opportunity to pray for you and to believe that God has great things in store for your life. For God liberates us and sets us free. To those of you that are first, second, and third time guests, please fill that card out for us. We really want to know that you're here. We want to celebrate your joining with us. No, you could have worshiped anywhere. But also at the end of the service, we have a, a hospitality for you. It is in our hospitality suite. It, it's right through these middle doors here. Take five steps, turn to your left. You'll see our hospitality suite there. And we have a gift for those of you that are with us for the first and second time. I want to encourage you to go and receive that gift. And you have an opportunity with a free cup of coffee to share just a time of fellowship, as much time or little time as, you're, as you have or are willing to take. And also have an opportunity to meet uh, one of our pastors, Dr. Darlington, our adult ministries pastor, one of the greatest men I've ever met in my life, a man with full of joy, and he is the man. I call him the man all the time. And he's, uh, Dr. Darlington is one of those kind of guys that always has a smile on his face, always has a good word. And so for you guests, you get a chance to meet one of the friendliest people you've ever met in your life. And we would encourage you to just take that moment to celebrate your joining with us here today, and we appreciate it so much. This morning we continue our series, I Will. I want you to say that with me, I Will. How many of you have made any promises this week at all? Let me see your hand. Have you made any promises? Oh my goodness. Some of you don't make promises, do you? I suspect you probably do. Now, we don't always say, I promise. That's sometimes we say, I'm going to do something. And that is a, and perhaps a promise as well. When you say, I'm going to do something, you have every intent of doing it, right? Well, I want you to know God says I will, and when God says I will, something's going to happen in your life. The fact of the matter, when God says I will, we expect something to happen. I know God. I've served the Lord for a number of years now. I know my Heavenly Father. And when my Heavenly Father says something, He's going to do what He says He's going to do. So that I begin to expect it, anticipate, and prepare that He will do exactly what He said He was going to do. So God, we... we at the very beginning of this, of this um, uh, series, we talked about how many promises there are in the Bible, and there are many, many promises. And the Bible is replete with people who have declared that God is faithful to all of his promises, and I say amen to that. But in response to God saying, I will, I respond to that. I respond to his promises. I respond to his commandments. I respond to his expectations by saying, Lord, you said I will, so I'll say I will. My will, I will, is not based only upon myself, but is based upon what God empowers me and enables me to do in my life. And I declare to you today, when God makes a promise, and God has made specific promises to us through His Word, but God has also made promises to us specifically, personally in our life. I, I will just tell you, going back to that story about my son James, when, when we were told that there was no hope, there was no medical answer to the to the disease that he had. As I was riding up an elevator one day to visit him in the hospital, a deep cloud fell upon me. I was the only one in the elevator, which was unusual in the medical center, but a cloud descended upon me, and it was a heavy cloud. It wasn't God. And, and I heard in my spirit, I heard the devil say, I'm going to take your boy, he's mine. And I'll tell you what, man, I just almost crushed with those words. But then right on the heels of that lie that the devil spoke, God said, the devil can't have him, he's mine. The devil can't have him, he's mine. 
And then it was, I, I, you know, the wonderful part of this story would be immediately he was healed, but it didn't happen that way. It was several weeks later that that prayer, that gentleman came and offered that prayer, and, and God began that healing. It was a, a, a relatively quick process, took several days, but quick in terms of the disease, and then God raised him up. And i got to tell you, I've come to the point to expect that when God says he's going to do something, I'm going to anticipate him doing it. In fact, I'll begin praising him for doing it before I see it with my eyes. Why? Because I believe. Because I know my Father, and I know he keeps his word. God always keeps his promises. Always keeps his promises. Lawrence Wallet, uh, Lawrence, Michael Lawrence said, From the opening pages of Scripture to their close, the story of God's redemptive activity is structured by promises made and promises kept. Throughout the Bible, God has made his people promises. To the children of Israel, to individuals, God has made promises. Even, even to Abraham that we referred to earlier, God made a promise to Abraham. Go, where shall I go? You'll go where I'll tell you to go. And Abraham packed up and he left. I've never been on that kind of journey. I, I've never been on a journey where somebody said, I want you to get in your car and go. Where? Don't worry about it. I'll tell you where to go. Well, I think I'd just back up and just say, well, now let's just hold on just a minute here. It, it, I, I, I'm willing to go, but you've got to tell me first, where am I going? You talk about trust, my friend. That is a radical amount of trust to go where God says, even when you don't know where the end will be. But I assure you of this. Wherever God takes you, it's going to be good. Wherever God takes you, it's going to be a tremendous blessing in your life. Psalms chapter 145, verse 13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all that he does. Let me read that again. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. Can you say amen? Amen. We've learned to trust him in his promises. We've learned to, learned to stand upon his promises. And then the scripture says, faithful in all that he does. The message version says, God always does what he says. I love the simplicity of that. God always, always, always does what he says he will do. I want you to turn to our text, Hebrews chapter 8. And this morning, what I want to share with you is this, and it, it may be a challenge to your faith, but I think you'll understand it, or a challenge to your doctrine, but I think you'll understand it when we give proper definitions. Today, God is saying, I will forget. I will forget. Now, I want you to hold on to that, because we're going to understand the depth of what that means here in just a moment. But here's what the Word says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, in the New Inter- International Version. And by the way, what we're going to read here is a direct quote from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. And we'll read that here in a moment as well. Here's what the scripture says. For I will forgive their wickedness. Aren't you glad? I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more. Now, I just got to tell you, I think right there we could say amen and go home rejoicing that God will remember my sin no more. Everything I've done wrong, every sin, every act of rebellion that I've ever committed in my life, God says, I will forgive you. But that's not all he says. That's not all of the promises he makes. He said, not only will I forgive you, and that's significant enough, my friend, but he said, I will remember your sins no more. Jer- in New, New Living Version said, New Life Version says, I will show loving kindness to them and I will forgive their sins. I will remember their sins no more. I've just got to tell you, if that doesn't bring a smile to your face, your smiler is broken and needs to get fixed. That's joyful in my heart that God will remember my sin. And, br- brother and sister, I know yours may be insignificant. My, my sins were most significant, most egregious. And God said, I will remember them no more, based upon his promise to forgive. Jeremiah chapter 31, from where this scripture was taken, I'm going to read it from the message version. It says, they'll know me firsthand, the dull and the bright. Now that just, that includes all of us. Now, there are no dull people at Brazewood. There are in other churches or other places, but not at Brazewood. We're all bright, amen? (laughs) 
And then he goes on, they'll know me firsthand, the dull and the bright, the smart and the slow. Everyone in this room is smart, amen? But we'll know firsthand. He said, I'll wipe the slate clean for each of them, and I will forget they ever sinned. God is declaring to us today, I will forget. But not only that, it's predicated upon the first I will, and that is, I will forgive. I will forgive. And I can tell you that forgiveness that God established within our life and offered to us is not a forgiveness because we've earned it or we have a right to it. It was by His grace alone, dependent upon His love. In this text, God is saying, and this is important, God is saying, I choose not to remember. I choose not not to remember. When God says, I will forget, in the Hebrew, to forget means to ignore. To forget means to neglect. To forget in the Hebrew means to forsake or act in willful disregard. Now, we want to take that in a positive strain. When God says he will ignore our sins, what he's saying is he's not going to remember them. They're not going to have an account. They're not going to have an effect on his relationship with us. When he says He's going to neglect our sins. It means he's cast them away, as we'll see in a moment. He's cast them away, and they will have no, no, uh, um, no uh, part of a decision that he makes on our part. And when he says that he will forsake our sin, not forsake us. In fact, God said he would never forsake us. But he is saying, I will forsake your sin. In other words, I'll cast your sin from you. When God says, I'll forget, it means he will not take action against us because he has already forgiven us of our sins. He will not take action based upon the sin of the past that we've committed. When God says, I will forget, it means he deliberately chooses not to exact due punishment for our sins. In other words, he doesn't give us what we've earned. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He doesn't respond to us based upon what we have earned because of our sin. Our sin deserves punishment. Sin has a consequence. I said sin has a consequence. Every act of disobedience in our life has a consequence. And by the way, let me add, just asking God to forgive us doesn't necessarily mean the consequence is eradicated. Sometimes... Sometimes by the grace and mercy of God, the, the, the effect of the sin is eradicated, but not always. Sometimes the effect of the sin, the consequence of the sin, is something that we have to um, live by. Or, let me put it another way, live through. God will get us through it. God will walk us through it. We will be victorious. But there are some things we're going to have to deal with in faith based upon the sin that we've committed, even though we've been forgiven. That's good preaching, Pastor. Keep it up. He'll not take action against us because he has forgiven us. He deliberately chooses not to exact due punishment. Why? Because he has ignored our sin based upon his faith, our faith, his grace. He has neglected the consequence of our sin in our life. And he has forsaken, willfully disregarded what was something that we earned. And then finally, and I love this, because he says, I will forget, it means... He will treat me with grace and with forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I count on the grace of God every single day of my life. I love God's grace. I love, I love experiencing God's grace. And I don't experience God's grace just when I sin. I experience God's grace when I breathe a breath of fresh air in my lungs. In the Greek, however, and the New Testament obviously was written in the Greek, it means, to forgive means, God chooses never to remember our sins again. It's his choice. I choose not to remember. And by the way, when somebody says, humanly, uh, to forgive is to forget, they really don't know what they're talking about. However, however, we can choose not to remember or choose how we remember. When I have been offended, I may remember but I've released the sting of that memory away. I've been delivered from the pain of that memory. In the Greek, to forget means God has chosen, and again there's that word, God has chosen to purge our sins from our record. He's got a big eraser. 
<laughs> and he erases those sins. He purges them by his choice. And that word purge literally means to eradicate. He eradicates our sin. He removes our sin. But I love this word. He acquits us of our sin. It's like a judge bringing down that big gavel. Boom. Not guilty. Hallelujah. God has declared us not guilty. Not because we didn't do the sin, but because of the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. That Jesus took upon himself all of the sin of humanity that was ever or will ever be committed has already been upon Jesus. And we've accepted, I have been declared not guilty. Say it with me, not guilty. Hallelujah. Finally, that in the Greek, literally, to forgive means he treats us as if the sin never existed. Praise the Lord. He treats me. He sees me. He looks at me. He loves me. He has a relationship with me as if the sin never existed. What a blessing that is. What a gift that is to humanity. Derek Prince said, when God forgives, he blots out the record of our sins. Our slates are clean. God does not have a poor memory. Understand that. God does not have a poor memory, but he does have the ability to choose to forget. <laughs> he, he doesn't have a poor memory because he remembers every promise he has made, and he fulfills every promise. You've got to have a good memory for that. Better than my memory. He chooses to forget and when he forgives, he forgets. He does what we're not possible, humanly possible for us to do. So God says, I will forgive, and we receive that by faith, not based upon how we feel, not based upon what we see, but by faith, confidence, trust in God. And God said, I will forget. I will remember your sins no longer. So in response, I say, I will receive God's forgiveness, and I declare, I will forget my sins. I choose not to stay fixated upon my sin, not to meditate on my sin. And, and can I tell you that sometimes some of the easiest and at the same time some of the hardest things for us to do, to forget. In fact, the reality of it is, as God doesn't forget, He chooses not to remember, that must be what we do. I choose to remember that when I remember my sins, I also remember they're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. When, when the sin is brought to my mind, either by a human being or by the devil or by my memory, when I focus or see those things or remember those things, I immediately respond, I am forgiven. And if the devil brings it up, I want the devil to know he can go where my sins have gone. I said it, and I didn't say it. The devil can go where my sins have gone. He is not going to torment me with my sins because I have received God's forgiveness, and I will forget. I will choose not to remember, or I'll choose how I remember my sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us, from all unrighteousness. Let me add kind of an amplified to that. If we confess our sins, that is to say the same thing about our sins that God says. That we say the same thing about our sins that God says. In other words, don't make excuses for your sin. But he did, but she did, but they said, but it doesn't matter what anybody else did. You sinned and you're responsible for your sin. You sinned, I sinned, and I'm responsible for my sin. Doesn't matter what anybody else does. It's my choice. No one forces me to sin. I choose to sin. But I say today, I will receive God's forgiveness, and I will forget. To say the same thing that God says about sin, because God doesn't lie, and what he says about it is truth, I may as well accept it. He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us, that is, to make us clean as though we had never sinned. And only God can do that. You can't pay. You can't undo the things that you've do, done as you can't unsay the things that we've said. They're done. But we can accept 
that God has made us clean through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the cleansing power of the, of the work that Jesus has done. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And Psalms 103, verse 11 and 12 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And the result of that is, as far as the east is from the west, so far is he removed our transgressions from us. In other words, he chooses never to remember them again. I say, I will receive forgiveness. And that's the key. That's the key. The key is not, I will forget. The key is not, I am forgiven. The key is, I will receive God's forgiveness. It's been offered to us, and not based upon anything that we can do. You cannot pay. You cannot earn you cannot deserve God's forgiveness. It's offered to you as a gift. It's a gift of faith. Faith, trust. To trust that what God said he would do, the promises that he'd make, that he says, I will, and something's going to happen. And when you ask him to forgive you of your sins, as we've just said, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. When we ask, it is with sincerity and honesty. And God knows our heart. He knows what's in us. He knows our motivations. You can't fake God out. You cannot deceive God. You can pray and ask God to forgive you a million times, but if it's not in your heart to be forgiven, you're not forgiven. Not just by words that we speak. It's an act of faith. It's trusting God and submissing to, submissive to God. And as a result of that, being forgiven, being cleansed, being as though the sin never, commit, never, uh, never happened in, in our life. Not because it didn't happen, but because God chooses not to remember it. And if you want to be forgiven of sin, if you want to forget your past, if you want to be acquitted of your past, you've got to come to Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved but the name of Jesus. It's not religion. It's not another name. Not another actor. It's only through the name of Jesus Christ. That is the door upon which we must pass through if we're going to be forgiven. And if you're here this morning online or on campus and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, today is your day. This is your promise. This is the, the, the promise that God has delivered to each and every one of us. So here's our challenge this morning. When God makes a promise, something's going to happen. Not by our effort to make it happen, but because God has already established it, we receive it in faith. God says, I will forgive, and we must be willing to receive his forgiveness. And then he says, if we receive his forgiveness, we ask him to forgive us. He says, I will not only forgive you, I will forget your sins. I choose to remember them no longer. There is no condemnation to us any longer. There is no death any longer in relationship to the sin of our past. But our response must be, I will receive God's forgiveness. It's an act of faith, trust, trusting God. Recognizing we need that and committing it to Him. But then it's another step. And we could take a whole month just dealing with the fact of, I will forget. I will choose not to harbor my sin. I will choose not to belabor my sins. I will choose not to focus on my sins, but rather I have received forgiveness through Jesus Christ and I will dwell upon them no longer. And when I remember, I will remember them always in relationship to they are forgiven. When I remember that act, whatever it may be, I will only remember it with, this, with these words attached, I am forgiven. God has forgiven me. The invitation then is this, it's simple. If you will ask God to forgive you this morning, if it's in your heart to be forgiven, if it's in your heart to be acquitted, it's in your heart to be claimed not guilty, then God will offer that to you this morning. God says to you today, I'll forgive you. It's, it's an open promise to each and every one, to anyone who will receive. And then he says, when you act upon that promise and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you accept the forgiveness of your sins, God says, in that moment, I will forget all of your sins. I will remember them no longer. And through that, and with that act of forgiveness, with that act of relationship with God, 
He'll change the story of your life. It is finished. The old book, the old story, the end. And God gives you a brand new story, a brand new book called a book of life. And that life is abundant life. If you're here this morning and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just pray that simple prayer in sincerity. Can't fake God out, He knows. But if you're sincere, Father, forgive me of every sin I've ever committed. Forgive me for my rebellion. Forgive me for my waywardness. Forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong in your eyes. Forgive me, Lord. And by the way, you don't have to beg Him. You just have to ask Him. And He will forgive you of your sins. But... Not only will he forgive you, but repentance means I'm not going back ever again. I'm changed. Changed. From this day forward, I am a child of God. From this day forward, I will grow in my faith. I will exercise my faith and grow in my faith. From this day forward, I will be known as one of God's favorites. And in that moment, God will walk with you every day, every step of the way. And when you fail, and you will, when you falter, you will, when you sin, you will. You always go to the Father because you have an advocate. His name is Jesus. And he will bring you back to the Father. Just like Peter, when he sank in that water, Jesus didn't walk away from him. Jesus didn't get in the boat without Peter. De Jesus didn't let Peter drown. Jesus reached out and picked Peter up and brought him back into that moment of faith and solidity in his life. And he'll do the same for you. Just pray that simple prayer. Father, forgive me. Change my life. Give me a life worth living from this day forward and make a commitment in your heart to turn your life around through Jesus Christ. And he'll do it. He said he would. He's faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins. And to our charge, challenge to each and every worshiper today, a charge to each and every one of us here and online, show the world the changed story of your life. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you would, just on the back of this card, it's a place called Decision Card. Just let us know that you made that decision so that we might pray with you and walk with you in faith and encourage you. Because at Brazewood, nobody has to walk alone. We'll walk together in faith, arm in arm. And when one is weak, the other will be strong. And when we're weak, you will be strong. And we'll walk together in faith. And be that authentic voice of God's love each and every day. And throughout the week, expect God's miracle. Have you received your miracle today? And you'll receive it each and every day. Faithful is our Father. Amen? This morning, I, I want to encourage you with these words. Don and I will be leaving for Africa and Amsterdam for a six, six weeks of ministry, something we've never done before. We've never traveled that long or been gone that long before. However, we leave the church in good hands. And by the way, we're returning, okay? We're coming back. We're not, we're not gone forever, though it may seem like it for a little while. We're not gone forever. But we leave the church in good hands. We leave the church in the hands of Pastor John, our co-pastor, Pastor Bruce, our executive pastor, the entire pastoral team, along with the Deacons Fellowship. You are in good hands, and I leave with absolute confidence everything is going to be okay. But even greater than these men's hands, you're in the hands of God. And He will guard you and protect you each and every day. And while we're gone, we would like to ask, you see on the screen the number of days or weeks that we're going to be in the different areas that we're called to minister in. Our heart is literally to build God's kingdom. As we've been declaring all along, my heart has never been, well, let me rephrase that. My heart is now not to build a church, but to build God's kingdom. And God's kingdom isn't the United States of America. God's kingdom is all over the earth. And even in places where nobody knows his kingdom is. Still, he reigns supreme. And so we'll be in port au -Court, Nairobi, Accra, and in Amsterdam. And we'd love for you to pray with us each and every day as the Holy Spirit puts us on your mind and heart that you would pray for us and pray for the pastors and leaders and the ministry that we're going to be serving overseas as well. What I'd love to do is stand up and say before we speak, there are people praying for you today. And I believe the Holy Spirit charging each and every one of us to do that very thing that on the Sundays, on the weekdays, in the leadership meetings that we have, in the individual meetings that we have, council that we have, that there will be somebody praying that God will abundantly bless, anoint, and empower His church wherever it may be. I'm going to invite the pastors and the deacons to join me on the platform here, if you would, please. And we've never done this before, but Donna and I feel... Donna, would you join us as well? Dr. Darlington, would you escort Donna, uh, please? 
Uh, we've never done this before, but we feel strongly impressed to ask you for prayer as we go. As I've said before, we've never been gone this long, and uh, we're not fearful, we're not afraid, but we do desire to go knowing that there are people praying for us. So I've asked the deacons if they would pray, if they would encourage us and anoint us with oil. So I'm going to ask you to stand if you would, please, everyone standing. And those of you online, if you would. And if you would, by faith, just stretch forth your hand. Matt, ask here, Brother Mark, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, Brother Mark Sidlowski, if he would offer a word of prayer for us. And if you would join around us. I want you all to pray with us, praise God. Pray in the spirit and pray with understanding, as Paul said. Amen. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for the anointing upon Pastor Steve and Donner as they travel, Lord, to these various ministry opportunities. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, the hand of the Lord is upon them, Lord. We thank you, Lord, the anointing is on them, Lord. Anointing to bless them, Lord, to, to use them, Lord, to be a blessing, Lord, to each and every congregation they come in contact with, Lord, that signs and wonders will follow the preaching of the word. Praise God. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, for safety, for protection, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for guidance, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that they shall pass over to Africa and return home safely in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. We thank you, Lord, for for travelers mercies lord that they each and every aspect of their traveling lord be in peace lord that lord that they will have no issues lord with their with their travels with their luggage with their hotel accommodations lord we just thank you lord for the favor of god is upon them in every aspect of their ministry and lord that they will not worry about what back here at home lord we thank you lord for the anointing upon pastor john lord and and the staff here lord as they take care of the needs of the church here lord in the name of jesus Father God, we just thank you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the wondrous works, Lord, that you, that will uh, accomplish them, Lord. Signs and wonders following the preaching of the word in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.